Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, hi, I'm Daza Greenwood uh, from MIT Media Lab and also executive director of law.mit.edu, which is the convener of today's workshop, the eighth annual MIT Computational Law Workshop. I just wanna start by saying, having done these things since actually the late 90s at MIT on this topic of law and technology, I honestly believe this is the best program yet. And that's owed largely because of a breakthrough with widely accessible generative artificial intelligence and its applications for law and its impact on law and legal processes. Um, how could generative AI tools like chat GPT be used in a legal context. You could use this type of tool for a contract. Well, wait a second, what kind of contract? A first draft of a contract. Let's just start with a warning. That standard should probably be in parentheses, but it does not go without saying, and I think it does not go without emphasizing that this class of technology is not perfect. Um, in fact, it's deeply flawed in some ways. Uh, it provides um, inaccurate and false information, uh, and that has a risk of relying on it uh, too much and just using the first draft as the last draft, for example. Um, it also could raise other legal, higher level policy issues with misinformation. It also has prejudices and biases that were brought in through the training set. So beware of those, of pro propagating those, uh, which can be deeply embedded within the results. And biases is particularly interesting in the legal context, which I'll come back to in a moment for fiduciary duties, but attorneys are one of those roles that owes fiduciary duties of loyalty to our clients. And that means putting the client's interest first. To the extent that the training data includes prioritization of corporate interests or a consumer interest or a you know, some particular government or cultural kind of interest, which can seep in as part of the bias, that may or may not be um, the same as the client's interest that we need to put first. So becoming aware of and a savvy consumer of these outputs um, as an input to us doing our job is critical. Okay, standard. Oh, and the last thing I would just say on this is um, something that um, I'll put it right in the chat here because these are really words to to live by. Um, this is a quote from Sam Altman, um, who is the, um, the head of OpenAI that provides ChatGPT. ChatGPT is incredibly limited, but good enough at some things to create a misleading impression of greatness. It's a mistake to be relying on it for anything important for now. It's a preview of the progress. So part of why, so now having said that, the reason these warnings are important is because stuff is amazing. Oh, like I was saying at the start of the workshop, we've just experienced a sea change, uh, like a, a major threshold moment uh, in terms of the capabilities that are now widely available and that have particularly good um, application uh, in for legal use cases. Can we hit the next slide, please? Um, what kind of applications? I mentioned contracts, only the first draft. Statutes, um, which, uh, if, if you've done the pre-reading, you will have seen um, my back and forth with ChatGPT on fiduciary duties. And it came up with what, I'm, I've written a few federal statutes in the US in my time. And it came up with a very good, I would say, first draft of a statute for the particular context that I had provided it. A complaint uh, in a judicial context, deposition questions, a brief, basically anything for a first draft, but it's not just drafts of documents. You know, the lawyers were very frequently document paradigm oriented. There's also processes. And I think that the biggest wins might be with legal processes. So for example, um, legal triage is something that Suffolk University Law School has been doing where people can, can individuals can speak in plain language um, and the um, AI can figure out what the relevant context is, can surface the legal issues and then get people to the right person to help them. Um, consumer rights. We're going to hear from Joshua Browder um, at the end of the session. He's doing remarkable things with interactive live real-time um, um, usage of this technology integrated into things like chat bots by companies. But, the, but his tool is representing the consumer interests, getting into a bot versus bot context there, and so much more. Um, next slide, please. One of the really interesting things here that, and something that Megan and I have been working on a, a lot, and you'll hear more about it in 2023, is 
the late, what you might call the latent knowledge or the capability overhang uh, that happens when you take all of this text and all these corp, more than one corpus is a corpora um, of, uh, from all across humanity and put it and you vectorize basically the words and the phrases and the concepts um, like in linear algebra, interesting patterns emerge that were heretofore unknown. And that could, is a new source of knowledge. Um, and it can be used very productively um, in lots of uh, commercial and academic and, and governmental and other use cases. There's so many possibilities. Uh, um, we, we've got some great speakers, so I'm just gonna skip across this for now and let, let's go to the next slide. There's a lot on that last slide though, to, we'll come back to later this year. So legal engineering, meet prompt engineering. You know we love legal engineering at law.mit.edu. Um, and you can look at our media page <laughs> to find um, some deep dives into what we think legal engineering is and why we think it's so important. Um, prompt engineering is a phrase you may have heard. Um, Megan just went into some of the details of it. We think that there's a subset of prompt engineering that is particularly useful in a legal context. And, um, and, and when, we, when, we talk, when I talk about a legal context, that really gets us back to a concept which also resonates in law from evidence, which is relevance. Um, and so one of the critical things to get great results from a prompt in a legal context is to design the prompt so that it provides the relevant context. Um, so by way of an example, and actually, do you mind if I screen share for a quick second, Ryan? Uh, Brian? Uh, yeah, just a moment. Let me, uh, let me get out of that. Yeah, there you go. You got it. So um, here's, here's just an example. Uh, so um, for deposition questions, um, the, you could ask it, give me deposition questions. And I put a link to this in the chat. But you, if you tell it things like the purpose of the deposition, the specific cases and uh, the parties involved, uh, the, it, some of this other relevant context here in, in the context of a deposition, it will give you much better ideas for questions that you could ask. Similarly, when I said a draft of a contract, you could say, give me a draft of a contract to buy a used car and you'll get back something that's pretty good. But if you were to ask it, um, I want a draft of a contract for a used car by individuals in the state of California and include the make and model, the, the purchase price, the, any warranties, et cetera, et cetera. Include this simple plain language in the prompt. Then you will have composed the prompt in, in a certain sense, legally engineered it to make sure that that relevant context is supported and reflected in the draft that you get. And that'll make that draft all the more valuable. Um, one of the things that I, the reason I posted this on our, our uh, workshop uh, GitHub repo is because when I was writing this and I was thinking, what do I say to the workshop participants about what's relevant in these different contexts? One of the things I did, which is a, a new go-to for me since uh, a month and a half, is I went to ChatGPT to ask it, what context would you need in a prompt in order to get the best contract? These were actually answers that I got from ChatGPT saying the context for, for these different things. And I'll tell you what, it was better than my draft. Like these are all twice as long as the examples that I had provided and they're, they're all quite good. The, the, the last thing I'll say is, is that, um, Prompt engineering, so mostly what I was just talking about was prompt construction or just prompt, you know, grammar and syntax and semantics in a way, which is important. You could say that's kind of legal engineering. We craft words. The deeper engineering here is, and we'll see with uh, Jesse Hahn and, and the other people have been doing this, is to be able to sort of integrate the prompts as part of a workflow that can be automated. So there's inputs at certain points. Um, we get an output that becomes an input for another part of a process. We can actually engineer generative AI at certain points in a, in a sequence of a workflow. That's even deeper concept of prompt engineering. And then the deepest is something I've, I've been calling prompt plumbing, which is at a much lower um, layer of the infrastructure. You can use uh, approaches like LangChain, um, which does some 
really um, interesting. It kind of takes summaries of the big blocks of text, vectorizes it, and carries the context forward. You can do things with much greater um, amounts of information than, the, than the, what happens just through an interface like ChatGPT where you run out of tokens. We'll get much more into all that later in the year.